All right, so good evening, everyone, today. Uh, welcome to our Grand Rounds. Uh, today, we're going to have an interesting topic for discussion in structural heart interventions, particularly imaging. Uh, before we go to the topic and the speaker, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share uh, the slides uh, to just get you through the MOC and CME needs. Uh, first of all, uh, for uh, cardiology Grand Rounds, uh, we have the YouTube channel where it is displayed. I was very surprised uh, recently, I just looked through and some of the structural interventions, uh, uh, imaging programs and uh, that have been placed on the YouTube have received over a thousand views. So I was incredibly pleased that I think whatever we are doing here is getting resonated and well uh, looked uh, in from different places. Uh, for the CME credits for today's lecture, please use the uh, text uh, 20377 to the number 888-816-4893, 888-816-4893. The deadline is within 12 hours as an SMS. You can do it now if you have an active uh, profile in Rutgers CME Cloud, uh, Cloud CME platform. And if you would like to get also the maintenance of certification points, and if you have your ABM ID uh, locked in with the Cloud CME, please complete the step one and then answer uh, the quiz uh, on this link. This link will be displayed again by Dr. Yan Mala in the chat box. The room code is future51. Again, you'll have to answer the questions correctly. And if you get them right, then yeah. you'll have your uh, MOC points directly going into your ABM account. So again, CME and MOC points again will be displayed back uh, into the cloud uh, CME profile. So with that, uh, I'm really pleased uh, to uh, welcome today um, Dr. Uh, Nadira Hamid. Uh, Dr. Hamid uh, is a close friend, colleague. Uh, I recently got to know her almost about um, a year back, uh, and we've been talking actively about uh, the field of structural interventions, and she has got some interest in AI, and we are looking forward to collaborating. But to tell a little bit about herself, uh, uh, Dr. Hamid is a very sought after speaker now in the national scene, particularly in structural heart intervention. She has made a special place in the tricuspid valve area, and I see her name every time I look at the TCT uh, or any other programs where valve diseases are being highlighted. Uh, so I was a little intrigued by her journey here, and she elaborated that she originated after a medical training in United Kingdom, and then subsequently had a sh short stint at, uh, at uh, Singapore, then completed her uh, echocardiography and advanced uh, interventional uh, imaging training at Columbia, and then went back to Singapore. But she's obviously the talent to be found, and she was again called back uh, by Columbia to come back and assist them with their imaging program. Uh, very recently in 2022, however, as you would know that she's very sought after, she was uh, taken up by uh, about Northwestern Hospital at Minneapolis Heart Institute, where you know that she's doing some amazing work uh, along with Paul Saraja and uh, others. Uh, in her CV, you would find herself uh, immersed in structural interventions. She has uh, uh, close to about 50 plus uh, uh, manuscripts uh, um, and also uh, uh, textbook chapters. She has uh, numerous presentations recently uh, and, and she's well sought after in ACC, THD, TVT. And she serves also uh, in addition uh, to a role, primary role as associate medical director of the EchoCore Laboratory at the Cardiovascular Research foundations. So without further ado, uh, Nadira, we are so glad you have come here. And I'm also going to briefly introduce you to uh, our panelists today, and it's going to be Dr. Yasmin Hamrani. And I'm very uh, excited that Dr. Hamrani has joined us and strengthened the structural imaging program. I'm sure that uh, between three of us, we're going to have a lot of questions to seek after this uh, difficult valve that is gaining a lot of importance in structural intervention, the tricuspid valve. So with that, uh, Nadira, please take us through your uh, lecture and we're looking forward to learning from you. Well, thank you so much uh, for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm really humbled by it. Um, let me share my screens. Um, and it's such a privilege uh, for me 
to be here among colleagues, friends, and if I've seen you in meetings, it's such a pleasure. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I wish I love New York as always. Dr. Sengupta knows that. And he's taken you through the history, my personal history. And I'll take you through my personal history on the tricuspid regurgitation. And certainly is one of my favorite valves, as he mentioned. So as with the other valves, AR or MR, but certainly the tricuspid is a very unique valve. And you've seen an explosion and the emergence of this transcatheter tricuspid therapies within the last year or two, and even more so in the future. And these are my disclosures. And so I take through my presentation always as, you know, it was said as the un the forgotten valve, as you hear is numerous. But for me, if you see on the left-hand side, um, you know, it was a fern that takes me back to Singapore, where if you touch it, you get little pricks and you can't in my family say, touch me not. But now the tricuspid valve is, has grown to a beautiful valve, as you see on the right hand side, that is a forget me not valve that no, everybody can't stop talking about it. Um, and that's great because, you know, we raise the awareness. So we are screening more. We are not underestimating the severity of TR, which used to be that's the issue with echocardiography. And why is it so? Because the leaflets are so thin, they are variable. Uh, we know that there's a tricuspid nomenclature with a different pathology and scallops. It is a very challenging valve to image. And I told Dr. Sengupta during, before we go on live, that it really is a humbling experience when I go into the cases, as you know, there are some cases where it's so hard to image because it's most anterior. You can get acoustic shadowing, not only from the left side of heart disease. If you have a bioprostatic or prostatic, you have a thick septum um, or let alone uh, ASD occluder, it is very challenging. And also the path of the TE and the esophagus may May not allow us to have on force imaging. And so we try every trick of the, uh, the tools to try and optimize this image. And sometimes, as you know, nowadays that ice imaging has already uh, revolutionized the TE imaging, especially for the tricuspid valve and used as an end job. So we all know the etiologies of TR. We have primary, secondary, and the bulk of it is actually that atrial functional TR that we see uh, in women with, uh, with atrial fibrillation for many years. But the new nomenclature or the novel TR classification that I think we should adopt more, um, I do certainly in my echo reports, is really defining the functional. Is it an atrial or ventricular functional um tricuspid regurgitation, is it related to leads, which is called a CIED related, which we see a lot nowadays, um, and also not forgetting the organic or primary uh, TR. I think using this classification would be very helpful as to how the improved outcomes is still work in progress and something we look forward to with the pivotal trials that we're learning from, like the Triluminate, and at TCT, the other late-breaking trial from Evoke. So the question then for me as an echocardiographer that I'd like to start off my presentation with is why do we assess TR? I think it is important. Um, and we all know the new TR grading scheme. We see severe, that's a red flag, but I think we need to go beyond that as echocardiographers um, and don't just look at the color. I think really quantifying beyond severe, massive or torrential. And why so? And I've been you know, honored to work with Becky and in terms of expanding this TR scheme. And we started with the SCOUT trial and found that a lot of these TR were beyond severe. Um, they have an EROA, which is the effective regurgitator office area, close to two or um, even more in some of this really tsunami tricuspid regurgitation. And so what we found that if you reduce the EROA even by one grade, that even that one grade from torrential to massive or massive to severe, these patients actually feel better. They have increased forward stroke volume. And because they feel better, they have the improved quality of life um, uh, quality uh, parameters, which is KCCQ score. And so I think quantifying it helps, especially now in all those clinical trials. And so the AASC, obviously, you know, the guidelines in 2017, this is how many years ago, the quantification is a lot of it on qualitative and quantitative 
and is basically on PISA. And we know the limitations of PISA and the reliance on PISA on the AAC guidelines. It is easy, um, it, but certainly uh, let me take you through a lot, a couple of the parameters, the new proposed parameters that we do in the core lab and also in my clinical practice. Um, and it is initially time consuming, but over a period of time, really it's quick and really reliable. So I take an average vena contractor from orthogonal views from your RV inflow and your four chamber. I do a lot of quantitative uh, measuring the stroke volume across the tricuspid valve and subtracting it from the left ventricle stroke volume or the RV stroke volume pending uh, if there's no regurgitation. And we do a lot of 3D vena contractor area. On transthoracic, it is challenging, but certainly on TE, it's certainly doable. And with PISA, reliance on PISA, um, we do need the pitfalls of it. So the inflow and outflow, the vena contractor, the pitfalls of just using one single view. So you can imagine the TR regurgitant jet, as you see on the left-hand side image. It's not certainly a circular, it's very ellipsoidal. So your inflow view and your four-chamber view, so it's often wider in the inflow view and smaller in the four-chamber view. And so we take an average of these two views. For the reliance on PISA, look at the 3D vena contractor area as we measured on TEE. It's certainly not circular orifice. It's a very flat leaflet with the tricuspid regurgitation, especially when you have annular dilatation. And PISA, you assume that circular orifice, that hemispheric proximal conversion. And the other point is that you take a single time point for measurement. As you can see, the jet is throughout the systolic cycle and it varies the radius. And so a paper by Winkle and my colleague, Dr. Han and Omar showed that actually integrating the PISA radius across the systolic cycle actually accounts for the temporal changes. It is tedious, it's meticulous, but certainly we do it in our core lab and also in my clinical practice as well in terms of measuring the PISA radius across the systolic cycle, not only for your tricuspid regurgitation, also for my mitral regurgitation as well. On top of that, we feel you know, not forgetting the angle correction for PISA. So Thomas Sally, um, the group in Europe actually showed last year that, you know, the conventional PISA measurements on tricuspid, it's quick and easy, but it underestimates in 50%. And so in their cohort, what they did was they actually corrected the PISA with the angle measurement on the left-hand side and actually shows an improvement in agreement with the 3D vena contractor area, which is actually the gold standard. And so they were reclassified find those patients who were not severe to severe just by 37% of the patients. So that small amount of PISA correction actually truly, you know, diagnosed the correct number of patients. And so we certainly can do better in terms of quantification by PISA. I certainly hope that's an automated way of doing it on transthoracic will save me a lot of time. And I think that would be the way forward in the um, echo field. Similarly, for 3D vena contractor area, I think it's very useful for dynamic and multiple jets. You can see one of the triclip cases that we did in our center. On the right-hand side, you can see really torrential TR, post triclip on transthoracic on the bottom left hand side that's where we did the uh, 3d measurement of the post triclip and the average of only 41 millimeters square which is less than moderate with a regurgitant volume of 26 on the top left hand side 3d on transthoracic for the tricuspid is actually our best friend because it's really anterior and you can get really beautiful 3d imaging on the left you can see the lead impingement on the septal leaflet of this patient and causing a ciED related tricuspid regurgitation and so quantification for TR is multiparametric um, you know and certainly we measure it in both the clinical trials and the clinical practice as well the vena contractor with both in the RV inflow and the four chamber view quantitation by 2D and 3D quantitation and also the 3D vena contractor area as well and so the pearls and pitfalls for quantitation of TR, I think really going beyond severe uh, because it has shown that to be prognostic in several studies, including the transcatter tricuspid registry uh, they had, including the vena contractor, which is quickest, you know, but beware of the elliptical, uh, elliptical shape of the regurgitated orifice. The, certainly the gold standard 3D vena contractor area, very excellent for dynamic multiple jets, but it can be time consuming, certainly practice and certainly you will get good at it. 
Pizza, make, making sure there's a lot of assumption, but certainly integrating it over the cardiac cycle has really helped to close that uh, agreement with 3D Vena Contractor area. And so I decided to add in a case example of how we, we got this patient. Uh, and you can see here, you can see on the left-hand side, this is the RV inflow outflow view. The tricuspid certainly is very, uh, leaflets are restricted, wide co-optation gap of 1.2. So here we measure the vena contractor at 1.3 centimeter with a wide jet area of 16.6 using an apical RV focus view as well. Here, the vena contractor 1.98. And so an average vena contractor area, um, area would be 1.65 centimeter. In terms of PISA quantitation, so we measured the radius at every systolic cycle. Um, and so an average of 1.2 centimeter with the calculation of a PISA ERA of 1.98 centimeter square and the regurgitative volume of 85 mil. In terms of 2D quantitation, measuring the annulus in mid diastole in the inflow and the four chamber view, as you've seen on the top right hand side, multiplying by the pulse wave across the annulus to get the stroke volume and subtracting it from the LV stroke volume in the absence of aortic regurgitation, getting the TR regurgitative volume and then getting the 2D ER away of close to 3.6 centimeters square, certainly a large, consistent with the MEL co-optation of those leaflets. And so those are in terms of tricuspid, you know, in the tra transthoracic in terms of quantitation, but it certainly gives you a flavor of the etiology of the TR, the quantitative assessment of TR severity, and gives you an idea of, in terms of what kind of transcatheter tricuspid therapies or even surgical options that these patients are, um, are able to perform and the options for them before moving on to the transesophageal echo, ensuring that these patients are uvolemic. And TEE is one of my other favorites for the tricuspid. It's challenging. And here are the views in terms of the four chamber view as well. But the critical view for the TEE is your bicommercial view, similar to your mitro clip view for your bicom view, is the RV inflow outflow view. As we sweep across from your anterior to your posterior commissures, and really the key thing is in your orthogonal view, is really seeing that septal leaflet, the question that we have, the length of the septal leaflet, and whether is it adequate if for a tear therapy, what are the length of the gaps, and certainly where is the target zone uh, for, for therapy. Your grasping view for 140 for 180, certainly uh, maneuvering the TE probe in terms of anti-flexion in the higher esophageal or deeper esophageal view. Our favorite is the uh, distal esophageal view if your mid esophageal views are not adequate. But one of my favorite views is certainly the transgastric view. I think you get a lot in terms of uh, in, uh, lead, in terms of trajectory, impingement. And the most important thing is, I think, is the tricuspid valve nomenclature. And why do we so? I think really is to improve that communication between the interventionists as us images as well. Um, we know the tricuspid, not all of them are just three leaflets. Majority of them from this retrospective registry actually has four functional leaflets with two posterior leaflets being the most common, and that's type 3B morphology. Um, here are some examples that um, I have seen in my uh, screening of patients for TR, two leaflet morphology type 2, and that's easy because you think of it as like a mitral valve in terms of the tear therapy. Top right-hand side, two posterior leaflets of type 3B, two septal leaflets in the bottom left with uh, type 3C, and type 4 morphology, two anterior and two posterior. And I think over the last two years or three years, we learned that these multiple scallops for tear therapy, you have different multiple co-optation planes, which may make the tear therapy challenging uh, in terms of TR reduction. The secondly, as well, the question is whether should we replace this, uh, repair this uh, treatment with tear therapy or replace these patients if with in complex uh, morphology with, uh, with a, a replacement therapy. So these are the questions that I think we are learning a lot more uh, from the pivotal trials as we do the screening calls um, and also uh, something to look forward to with this trial's results. But I always, you know, besides the tricuspid paper, I think we should not forget about the entire chamber, which is the right ventricle for the, uh, the right side of the valve. Similarly, for your mitral, you want to make sure you look at the, the left ventricle, left atrium, and of course, the right side of the valve. 
So for the tricuspid, we have, there's a lot of talk about the RV, how we assess it. And certainly in echocardiography, it is challenging. I find it's um, yeah, in transthoracic. Uh, we all, the ASC always we use the RV focus view. But it, the challenges in getting this view is depends on the RV dilatation and the direction, highly dependent on probe rotation, uh, difficult to image the RV lateral wall, and we can actually over and underestimate these linear dimensions. And so I think, you know, a lot of work has been done uh, from the vendors in terms of getting 3D RV volumes. I've tried it, it's challenging, it's certainly doable, um, and something that I think we can do better. And I look forward to doing this more in the 3D RV volumes in an easier workspace and getting correlation with cardiac MRI, which I think has been shown as well. RV are a, a global longitudinal longitudinal strain as well is certainly I do often in the TR cases just to have a flavor of it, but certainly um, is uh, doable and really easy with the new uh, um, systems uh, provided by the vendors. Now, in terms of other um, RV function and non-invasive measures of RVPA coupling, as you've seen by one of my colleagues, uh, Mike Brenner, who published this, and you know you have the um, uh, differences and the RVPA coupling, you can get strain over RVSP, uh, fractional air change or TAPSI over RVSP, and they have shown, Fortuny actually um, published this first, that the RVPA coupling, if you has been shown in relation to mortality in TR. Um, and so a cutoff in his group in Europe is about 0 0.31. But um, Mike Brenner actually used the data from the tri transcatter tricuspid valve uh, intervention and showed that the cutoff is 0 0.4. Um, if you have anything less than that, certainly it shows that these patients have a poor RV function, they have obviously no afterload reserve. And so the mortality after doing a transcatheter therapy certainly is higher than those with a higher um, RVPA coupling. Good, I think it's certainly a key important parameter. We need more work in this, especially in the prospective studies and the pivotal studies and something that we are looking at um, in the clinical trial. And so I think a novel approach to tricuspid imaging, certainly bread and butter, echocardiography, my favorite transthoracic TEE, and not forgetting as well, I think uh, CT and cardiac MRI adds that flavor as well um, in terms of sizing, RV function, um, and also volume as well with, uh, with cardiac MRI in terms of morphology of the RV. And so I think I've taken you through in terms of imaging of the TR, um, the transthoracic and the, and the TEE. And you know, a lot of we are seeing a lot of these patients, I'm sure in your clinical practice, like tsunami TR. And these patients have been neglected um, from severe and then beyond to torrential. There's undercoding of severity of TR. Um, people think that RV size as well is an unreliable indicator and a late phenomenon. And really we have a poor understanding of the timing and most certainly the benefit of intervention of these patients because they may tell you that asymptomatic with severe TR, um, do we treat it or do we leave it alone? And so is the RV function and there are some patients RV functions are still poor. Um, so a lot of unanswered questions and I think uh, transcatheter therapy can address a lot of these issues um, in terms of treatment of these patients before the surgical options or are they high risk surgical options. And so taking you a flavor of the evidence of the tricuspid theotherapy um, and also the replacement therapy. And as we all know from ACC, um, the triluminate pivotal trial prevented by my colleague Paul um, was uh, at the ACC with the triclip system. Um, I'm, you know, I think you're familiar with this. If you're not in your practice, certainly the triclip uh, G4 system was specifically designed for the tricuspid, uh, unique from the mitroclip because of the l knob, and certainly is really to get away from the septal hugger. Um, and you have the other features as well, uh, the septal lateral movement. And so for the triluminate pivotal trial, um, you know, it was a rigorous um, trial and I was privileged to be part of it as the echo core lab screening committee um, and learn a lot. Um, and these patients were, um, you know, were screened through from medical therapy 
to the yeah, echo uh, parameters and will randomize to the triclip to the medical therapy. And if these patients were able to reduce the TR to moderate or less, and if they're not, they will go into the single arm, especially for patients uh, with cardiac leads. But as we learn through the trial process, I would say a lot of the interventionists were comfortable and now we have pushed the envelope now uh, that we are treating uh, triclip with patients with uh, lead impingement. Um, the fact that we, if we can reduce the TR reduction just by one grade, these patients do well. Um, and so for the triluminate trial, the baseline characteristics, we learned that a lot that these patients are sick. Um, they have the cardiovascular risk factors. They have previous surgical interventions, whether aortic mitral or previous tricuspid uh, intervention. We have also treated patients who have had heart transplant uh, in the trial, um, you know, and these Co-optation gap, as we learn, uh, for the tier therapy, it should be less than one for this trial. The randomized trial is about five. The heart size function uh, in terms of the RMB was still relatively preserved. They were dilated, and most of them have normal LV function. And so they showed that the TR reduction um, was uh, uh, all the way sustained to 30 days and all the way to one year. Um, this device has a great safety profile in terms of cardiovascular mortality. Um, in terms of uh, tri uh, tricuspid valve intervention, I think there was only one patient. Bleeding, not much. Uh, SLDA is about 6 to 7%, similar to what it was in Europe. The primary endpoint, as we all know, the triclip therapy demonstrated superiority to medical therapy is really driven by the improvement in KCCQs. And a lot of discussion have been going on in terms of, you know, this trial since uh, ACC presentation, but these patients feel better and these patients are old, so they do feel better. But certainly in terms of survival, the one-year outcome similar in terms of death and heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death. I think this is all one year. We have so much more to learn as we follow up these patients from two years all the way to five years. I'm really excited to see how, because certainly um, I feel that seeing this patient in the clinical practice and the research that the tricuspid is certainly different from the mitral. And so following up this patient long terms would be key and certainly something that I will look forward to. Um, but my take home from the trilumate data was that um, it is a safe, uh, uh, safety profile is there. Uh, it met for device superiority really by the quality of life improvement. And I've seen these patients in my clinic where they tell me that they were able to put on their, their shorts or their socks again, and they feel they can go back to their uh, activities of daily living. And that gives me pleasure to see the improvement uh, of their TR reduction and their quality of life. And so looking forward to that uh, data in the long-term survival, and I believe the, I think they have a late-breaking trial at TCT for the single arm data. So something to look forward to and next year too, uh, as we learn more about the triluminate trial. And so similarly, all across into the European side, they have the real world outcomes over there is a proof. Um, and so their initial one year outcomes from the BRIGHT trial presented by Philip Lurs, um, you know, similarly as well as uh, evaluating that safety and effectiveness in the real world setting. So these patients have severe symptomatic TR. Um, and similarly to triluminate trial that these patients a lot, 51% were women, um, they have a high pacemaker uh, CIED related, as we see in real world, and they all have massive or torrential TR. These patients do well after the tear therapy, clinical improvement in terms of KCCQ score, NYHA classification, and heart failure hospitalization too. Um, what about the other tier uh, device, the class 2 TR? Um, you know, they are enrolling similarly as well. They present a two-year outcome mortality, um, heart failure hospitalization, randomized uh, to or versus optimal medical therapy. And they also have a single arm looking at NYHA and the KCCQ 
KCCQ score and the six minute walk test. But their early feasibility study as well shows similar pro um, promise as well in terms of TR severity. Uh, they all have massive torrential uh, clinical improvements similarly with KCCQ score, NYHA classification, six minute walk test. Their one year survival certainly uh, also was there. And so the key points in terms of tier therapy for TR, I think you know it is a safe, effective repair solutions for these patients who have no few options. Um, and we are learning more about survival. And one thing I learned that this is not a left-sided disease. You want to improve their quality of life. And I think uh, looking forward, certainly in terms of the follow-up study and the pivotal trial results, as we understand what kind of patient selection that is suitable for tear therapy. And so, you know, from that, I like to talk a little bit more about transcatheter tricuspid replacement. Um, I'm uh, privileged, you know, um, that I not only had experience with Evoke and the other, which I'll show you um, the other promising uh, tricuspid replacement therapy. I think certainly is is really is is there's a certainly a niche there and a place there for the tricuspid, um, but certainly there's challenges. You have the asymmetry of the tricuspid annulus. These patients' annulus are dilated; they are large. In addition to that, you have a short distance to RV free wall. So there's some uh, tricuspid replacement therapy required that distance to the RV free wall. In addition to that, you have the valve, uh, you know, um, impinge, um, you know, causing a little stress onto the annulus and may cause potential conduction dis disturbances um, after uh, implantation of these devices. And so you want to avoid excessive oversizing, annular enlargement, uh, complications of the RV free wall and the septal interactions. And so in terms of patient selection is so key besides TEE, of course, CT, Imaging of the tricuspid is key as well in terms of patient selection for the uh, the valve replacement therapy, and so one of the I'd like to show you one of the new um, you know still um, work in progress early feasibility of the uh, tri uh, tricuspid transcatheter device uh, replacement therapies, which is the VDine. We did the first in Abbott Northwestern, so you can see here on the bottom left hand side. Uh, it's an asymmetric outer frame, and you can see really fitting in into the um, posterior tab and the anterior tab and kind of sits, um, you know, really nicely into the tricuspid valve. And so we did the first case um, over here in Abbott Northwestern, and I'll take you through uh, a few more slides of it. But certainly the frame matches that asymmetric tricuspid annulus. There's no bobs or paddles. You don't have to image the, um, the hooks. Um, it has a broad size range of up to 170 millimeter par parameter. Um, it's leaflet independent imaging. Uh, it has a pop-off solution as well. So you can create, there is a hole there. So if you have a torrential TR, you can actually kind of um, prevent that RV from, you know, RV, severe RV dysfunctions by leaving at least moderate TR. Uh, it's repositionable, retrievable. Um, and had really had minimized uh, minimal RV interactions. So we did the second generation. Um, I think right now we're still undergoing um, developmental process, uh, developmental changes. But as we learn more about this device, so we have here a 68 year old lady with uh, NYHA class three with severe functional TR with a relatively, um, I would say, reduced RV function uh, and normal LV function. You can see dilated RV. And so the V-Dine, you will first need to do what we call a balloon flossing, the wire across into the RV inflow outflow. And this is to just allow the pathway of the device into the RV OT tab. Uh, where we call the RVOT engagement. So you can see uh, using fluoroscopy and 3D NPR, uh, really situating that RVOT seating into the RVOT tab there and localizing it. And you can see on 3D NPR as illustrated on the yellow uh, arrows that it is um, seated very well uh, of the RVOT tab. And then after which, once you secure that tab, it's really unsheathing and um, cinching, as you can see on the top right-hand side, 
trying to fit the valve into the tricuspid because of the asymmetric annulus you have. You have the cinching of both AP and the SL cinching, depending on the fluoroscopy and on echo imaging as well. And once the valve is feet, uh, seated, um, you can see here com um, confirming on echo uh, in terms of the seating because uh, to make sure that it's seated well, as they can still maneuver it to ensure that the free wall you can see here in arrow is seated well across the annulus. Um, and the final images here, you can see on fluoroscopy on the lateral view and the on force view as well, and our echo, um, no TR. The RV you can see on TE, the RV strain still have preserved RV function. Um, and this patient did well, uh, post up day six. Um, and following up in seven months is still doing uh, very well and is on anticoagulation as well. And so this valve certainly is promising. We presented it at London Valves last year and um, in, presented it in the European Heart Journal. Um, the beauty about it, it preserves that asymmetry of the tricuspid valve annulus. It has a low profile. Um, we've done up to three successful cases, still going revision of the uh, uh, design, but certainly um, global uh, EFS is on the way and hopefully uh, the United States uh, IDE will be um, soon approved as well for implantation here. And so I think, you know, for the tricuspid, I think I would like to say what are the opportunities that we can do? Um, I think it's a great way we have achieved all these years. Uh, the first randomized control trial, the triluminate pivotal trial, I mean, testing the impact of TR reduction. Um, you know, it's uh, in meticulous in terms of the excellent safety. Uh, you have the ECPM to ensure that these patients have optimal medical therapy before enrollment. Um, to And we are still learning as to what is really the optimal medical therapy for these patients besides diuretics. And so our heart failure colleagues certainly play a huge role uh, in our collaboration with the valve team as well uh, for this purpose besides the mitral valve. And so, you know, we also at the same time with the RCT understand that TR is just not a bit functional. So you want to include those patients with pacemaker, uh, poor EF or also increase pulmonary um, artery hypertension. And so certainly something that we need to think of as we move this, uh, you know, the uh, pivotal trial into the real world uh, registry. The second opportunity that I think we can do is really establishing new clinical pathways. I think, you know, it's a chance and opportunity for us in terms of ECHO um, for TR quantitation led by, you know, all the key opinion leaders like Becky uh, Zamorano, you know, in terms of that uh, expansion of the grading scheme and how we can do better from a vendor, from an echocardiographer um, in terms of uh, automation of these parameters to make our life easy in the ECHO lab and better description of it as well using 3D. Um, so certainly changing the schemes for TR grading because we see those extreme pathology as you can see on the left hand side there where it's certainly like a Niagara Falls there. Um, not sure how this patient is alive but certainly is uh, we see these patients because uh, TR is so silent. Um, and another thing that I mentioned earlier on, uh, that TE imaging is challenging, and we are we are so privileged that we have, you know, ICE imaging, which has revolutionized from three different vendors. So here is Philips Very Sight Pro. You can see clearly in terms of this imaging, much clearer than the transesophageal echo, um, and possibly in the future doing it in under con conscious sedation for the tricuspid therapy. Um, I think it's, um, it's promising and I certainly think it might be there uh, in the long run. The other opportunity, um, I think, is new diagnostic methods. And so for the triluminate pivotal, we have the triclip imaging substudy led by my colleague, Dr. Joao Cavacante. And we understand post uh, imaging, you can see here 30 days that we are able to measure the regurgitative volume, look at the RV as well um, of these patients who undergo tricuspid therapy. The fourth uh, opportunity is really defining what is meaningful for TR severity, um, you know, in terms of reduction. And the other question that I have is, how much do we leave behind? Is leaving a moderate residual TR 
sufficient enough for these patients? Is it good enough? So these are the kind of questions that I think we will learn more and more uh, with these trials, um, you know, and uh, reduction by one grade, should, is that sufficient enough uh, with good remodeling of the RV? The fifth opportunity is I think we are set, uh, setting the stage for new treatments for TR. Um, I think besides um, surgery, as we know that their hospital mortality is high and these patients are high risk. And I think, you know, the fact that we are doing so much till now, I think we, you know, there's so much more to do that we certainly can do better. And so I'd like to end it by how I look at tricuspid imaging. And this is uh, taking me back to my safari trip. I thought of it as my big five for success in tricuspid. That is looking at gaps when I screen these patients. Is it small? Is it large? Uh, anatomy, look at the leaflets, the length, the mobility. Look at the different coarctation planes in your transgastric view um, and the nomenclature. L for leads, where are they located? What is the trajectory? Is there impingement? Is there interaction? I for imaging in terms of T windows, is there shadowing? Is there a horizontal art? Do I need to use eyes for the procedure? And others looking at the other chambers, pulmonary vasculature and the left sided. And so certainly the mnemonic Galio is what I use a lot for my big five success for tricuspid valve imaging. Um, and I think it's certainly an unforgettable valve. Uh, I look at it every single day from clinic to my echo lab. Um, in terms of, di I think we certainly have done so much well, uh, better in terms of diagnosing and screening these patients with echocardiography parameters. Uh, and of course, on top of that, advanced imaging modalities, CT, MRI, and now intraprocedurally, we have eyes to help us guide this procedure safely as well and with good outcomes. And I certainly look forward to, in terms of the new clinical pathways that are being established and uh, as we provide more insight, this studies in the impact on survival and quality of life. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nadira. I think uh, this has been a wonderful presentation. If you want to just bring down your slides, we will have back uh, Yasmin in the spotlight. Um, and uh, great, uh, fantastic. So, um, you know, tricuspid imaging is, is challenging. I have a few questions uh, uh, I would like to, first of all, that was an outstanding review and I continue to learn so much. And I think you must have seen more tricuspid valves than many of us here uh, in terms of uh, the variety of different morphologies, 3D and what happens to them after, particularly in the core lab. I mean, we do not get a chance to see a lot of the different types of outcomes. Uh, so it's a great opportunity. My first question uh, I wanted to ask you is about the um, right ventricular function. Uh, and, you know, often there is a question in our mind, particularly when the RV is massively dilated, there is torrential TR, uh, the leaflets are not co-opting. So the question comes up, what's hap going to happen to the uh, RV? Is it going to balloon out immediately if we completely shut it, particularly if you're going to do a trans tricuspid valve? Um, replacement. Um, I mean, luckily with any of the other procedures, you end up having a little bit of TR, so it's not a problem. But I know that uh, the Evoke, uh, it's carefully chosen, but do you have any sense of how you quantify when that RV is going to be terrible and we should not touch it? Because the quantification of tricuspid valve, uh, sorry, the RV in presence of severe TR, you always have a little bit of motion and you do not know what is hiding underneath it. Thank you, Dr. Sengupta. That's a great question. I mean, I think quantifying RV function on echo, it's really challenging, especially when you have that tsunami, that torrential TR. You, It is moving, but suddenly you know in your gut that it's not moving as well as what it should be. <laughs> and so I think using all those standard parameters, I'll do them. And then the GLS, I find the GLS sometimes helpful in certain ways. And it does show in my assessment, in most of the cases, that's actually lesser than my other parameters. Um, and what we do as well, and I think um, we do the other advanced imaging modality, whether mostly cardiac MRI, uh, to have that kind of baseline first. And then having that discussion at our valve meeting as to what is the best option or ideal, the options for these patients, whether it's a surgery, 
uh, valve replacement or tear therapy. If it's tear therapy, making sure the gaps are not more than one centimeter is approachable. If it's not, then, you know, if it's really poor RV function, and now you have the other option, which I forgot to mention, um, the trig valve. So you have the IVC and SVC implantation for these patients. And whether I think that's something that it might be promising as well, because you're trying to offload that. And the early studies show that actually they can have early remodeling of the RV. So maybe it gives an opportunity for another device to put in, whether it's a tear therapy or a replacement. Uh, once you kind of shrink that RV. So these are questions that we still are, um, you know, un answering. But I think from ECHO, challenging, um, doing all the standards uh, parameters. And I think with the advanced imaging modality, whether it's a CT or MRI. And I think the MRI gives you that flavor as well of the RV function. And we have seen in cases where we replace it, and the RV shut down intraprocedurally. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to bring in Yasmin a little bit uh, to this, uh, to comment on that. But I want to just ask you, and maybe uh, this is me and my understanding, or maybe it's a global understanding. I don't know. I want to validate you to validate this. So my understanding is that uh, the right heart, uh, when you develop severe TR, unless the RV EDP is uh, increasing the central venous pressure would not increase. So what I'm trying to say is that, I mean, I've seen several patients of Epstein's or you have several patients of congenital unguarded tricuspid valve who have torrential TR, but they don't have a they don't have heart failure. Uh, mm -hmm. They can have severe TR, but they don't congest. Uh, on the other hand, we are seeing several other patients where they are like coming with paracentesis and ascites. Um, I feel like they may be a little bit more a, a later stage and maybe the TR is contributing, but I think it's also the failing RV that contributes to be able, I mean, they're connected together. But my point is that the uh, RV is also unable to accommodate the severe TR. It's got remodeled beyond, and then, you know, the central pressure rises and uh, congestion develops. And, you know, you get this central uh, venous pressure, mean pressures of 15, 20. Uh, are those very advanced stages? Uh, and if those are the cases where I think we not, one has to be very careful because maybe we bring them back, uh, aggressively diarize and re-image them and see what the RV looks like. I mean, I don't know. Is this is this something that you guys do or how do you uh, go for those kind of tough cases where, the, where they're re reaccumulating every 30 days and, you know, you, you want to put them on? Have you encountered such cases? Yeah, no, great question, Dr. Sengupta. I think certainly have. I think, you know, um, uh, we have experienced those kind of cases. And I think uh, that's where the close follow-up with heart failure. And I think a lot of these patients for the valve replacement or even the repair, what some centers do and most centers do, we do the cardiac, uh, the diuretic rehab. So admitting them a few days before diary saying, um, and reevaluating not only the TR and the RV function as well before subjecting them to the uh, to the device, um, and then some of them have uh, you know inotropic support before going into the procedure uh, in anticipation of that RV failure. <laughs> we have we have done that way as well, um, and so post procedure then we just wean them down. Uh, some of them get weaned down all. The some of them don't. They go home with that inotrope as well, assist, uh, depending. And so I think those patients with, uh, you know, um, repeated paracentesis, like you mentioned, I think those are really end stage to me. Um, they probably would have some level of liver cirrhosis, liver congestion, esophageal varices probably. And so doing a T on them, we probably have to be very careful. I remember uh, screening these patients because we try cuspid T imaging. We are down in, we are going up and down, <laughs> I know, braising the, <laughs> the esophagus. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm, I hate to say this, but I, you know, I am, but we sometimes cause that as well. And I think we have to be very careful when we image these patients, especially during the procedure. 
um, when we use those 3Ds and 3D MPRs for a pretty long time, and then those get heated up, the probe get heated up to 40, you stay there for a while, and they cause the lining of the esophagus to get, you know, a little heated up too. So, um, you know, we just have to be aware as our interventional echocardiographers to, to freeze it for a moment, let it cool down. Um, so these patients, I think, are really end stage, I think those kind of patients, you have liver cirrhosis, you have um, paracentesis every other week. Um, what can we do for these patients? Because they're certainly not surgical options. Yeah. Um, you know, and transcatheter valve replacement may or may not, because especially they have very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, yeah. they may be excluded. Um, repair, I think once is commercial, um, hopefully, you know, to use it. Um, and I think, um, what left would be, you know, the other therapies like the trig valve, I think, you know, uh, which is currently still in, um, uh, uh, trial. So whether or not inclusion, exclusion criteria. Um, and so I think there's a need for us to do better in these trials to make it available, all the different options for these patients. Cause we're seeing a variety of these patients and there's no one therapy that is for, for, all patients, I think, for the tricuspid valve. Yes. Similarly for the mitral. I think more so for the tricuspid. The mitral, I think, you know, it's challenging in different ways because we see mitral clip and then the TMVR, um, still learning a lot, <laughs> the TMVR. Um, so the tricuspid certainly is another challenge. Yes. Yes, Ben, your, your turn. Uh, thank you. It was a great talk and thanks for sharing your experience and your knowledge in this uh, topic. Yeah, there's a few things I just kind of wanted to pick your brain on and thanks for sharing again your experience. Um, and I had this discussion with uh, Angela Cavacante, like for MRI, et cetera, as well, um, in regards to assessing tricuspid regurg. But, you know, the first thing on echo, so, you know, I always say, you know, uh, the quantification of TR is in the eye of the beholder, right? So in a core lab, like your core lab, like you said, you check every single phase of the cardiac cycle, every single beat, and you're looking at PISA measurement, and then you come up with, okay, averaging it out, and is it moderate? Is it severe? So in, in a place where, you know, we have, 100 echoes a day, and we have amazing sonographers, but you cannot spend an hour and a half with every single TTE, or in fact, a TE to quantify the TR. And we want to get patients, you know, and of course, there are patients we are missing because we are not assessing the severity um, as adequately as we should. What would be your suggestion um, uh, based on your experience. Um, now, my second question is, you know, um, so MR, very good test to assess right ventricle, right? But if you assess tricuspid valve regurgitation, you compare the TR and MR with TT or TE, sometimes they're, they, they don't match the volumes. They are different, right? And they, that do regurgitation volume and regurgitation fraction. So right. how, do you, how do you deal with that? And MR is not very good in anatomy. It's just RV function, then you see better on CT. So what do you do when you pick these patients? Do you do an echo, a TTE, a TE, a CT, an MRI? What are your thoughts on that? And my last question is in regards to ICE. So who performs ICE? Is it interventional cardiologists that get trained to do ICE or it's uh, an imaging cardiologist who's doing ICE? Sorry, I haven't bothered with questions. <laughs> No, I love all those questions. And I will answer the third one, the eyes, because I love eyes imaging. And I honestly feel I would love to hold the catheter. I love it. I tried it on the simulation. Uh, it's pretty, it's easy because we know, you know, but the challenge with eyes is that because we are not holding it, we are no longer in control. We are in the console and the, the interventionist is, is, is holding it and manipulating. And so I always feel good when I tell Paul, I'll wait for you <laughs> because he has to get me. <laughs> Usually I, he will wait for me. And then now it's my turn that he has to, you know, I wait for him. <laughs> so it gives me pleasure saying that to him and he, he will always laugh. But um, I think with ICE, I think um, it's a different uh, learning curve. And uh, it's because the, the, the thing is, like I said, the interventionist is holding the probe and we imagers are standing in a console and we, we can't do much with, you know, we have to guide them because, you know, now they're holding it. Um, so that's the learning curve, I think. And um, I, there are, I think there's certainly a role for us, interventional echocardiographers to manipulate that, but it will take, 
you know, you have to make sure the console is also sterile as well. So practicality in the lab might not be there. So still, I think the interventions will still hold the ice catheter and we manipulate the console. Um, there's a lot of programs now and workshops um, at CBI was part of it where we en encourage the, both the interventionists and the echocardiographer to be there. And so if you're attending TCT, there's a couple of workshops on this. Um, and so certainly something to, um, to look out for, um, for both the interventionists and the echocardiographer. So the other two questions, <laughs> I think your second questions with the discrepancy of the MR and TR volumes and regurgitation. And I completely agree with you. I've seen it in uh, clinical practice here. Um, I would say, obviously I would say go with echo <laughs> because <laughs> it is what we see, um, the color adopter, the 3D vena contractor error with the multiple parameters and qualitative and quantitative. I think, you know, but the advanced imaging is really helpful. Like the CT in terms of annular sizing, learning about the the you know the the height of the rv the cords the um mri in terms of rv function so we combine all those information for certain for a lot of these complex patients so that we have a better understanding of the right side before deciding what's the best treatment option so i think there's no one um you know imaging to decide, I think using all three, but certainly in terms of TR, MR quantitation, I think nothing beats a good TE imaging. Sorry, <laughs> I'm still a TE fan. Um, and to your first question, um, sorry, can you remind me what's the first question? <laughs> I just wanted to kind of clarify because you know you do an every single beat and every single phase. Oh, every yeah, beat. yeah. So. Believe you or not, I think maybe I've gotten so fast at doing it <laughs> um, that even I do it for my clinical practice. So I already, I hope that one day that the vendors can actually do it automated for us. That would be ideal. Um, you know, I think the, uh, and also in terms of the 3D vena contractor era. So if we could just automate, like we capture it, that six bit acquisition of the 3D color. And then when we press a button, like an AI assist, and then it goes automated, the value comes up, average it, that would be my dream. <laughs> but until then, I would measure it, uh, you know, the orifice area um, throughout the systolic cycle. But I think the gist of it, if you get at least two or three, you know, that's a, you know it's going to be severe. But the issue is when it's in the middle, borderline whether it's between severe or moderate to severe, that's the key, I think. Um, you know, especially for this trial patients, we want to make sure they're really severe. There was a few patients that were declined because of moderate to severe. Um, and it's really, it shows us that the TR is dynamic. So at that point of time, when the you know, patient is imaging, is patient is probably uvolemic, has no reversal, it looks a lot, but it's just like, you know, it's a myxomatous leaflet that split second, it looks a lot, but not really, it's moderate to severe. And so that patient's, you know, but if you image another time when the patient is overloaded, of course it's severe. And so it just shows like MR, the dynamic nature of TR um, and the limitations of quantitation. We do our best, but uh, hopefully with automation, it gets easier. Thanks, Emma. And, you know, in the same regard, you know, uh, we put patients on diuretics, but they cannot tolerate diuretics for the rest of their lives. There will be times when they have to come off of it. And that's when the TR is severe, and that's when they get severely symptomatic. So maybe I wonder if we should hold diuretic on these patients and assess the TR and treat it based off of that. <laughs> I think, you know, diuretic, it's kind of the enemy and underlines, like you said, that true severe TR because they have severe TR, they have, you know, you give them diuretics, they feel better and they are in the clinics, you know, and for years until their analysts get big, their RV get big. And by the time they come to a valve center or someone, they get symptomatic, their RV blown out, their gaps are like one centimeters. And that's hard of how we treat them. And so, you know, back to, that's why I say with the TR, my first couple of slides is really making sure we image and get that severity TR early, um, you know, that diagnosis early. And so hopefully we can do better 
um, in terms, you know, and and so they can live longer, hopefully, survive over the pivotal trial results. So hopefully. <laughs> Thanks so much. No problem. Thank you very much, Nadira. This was a great discussion. And I think um, um, I will continue to learn a lot uh, in the near future. And uh, we'll continue to invite you. Uh, oh, hopefully in awesome. person next time when you come here. Absolutely. We'll love to come there in person. Thank you very much for joining. And for all of you, uh, this uh, is going to be available online. So please feel free to take a veil of the recorded video. And also please answer your questions to get the MOC points for the CME. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.